This is the Magic Word Podcast.com. Hello, this is Scott Wells for the Magic Word Podcast.com. Well, we have another full episode here this week as we actually go into our sixth week of the Magician's Relief Project, and I want to thank all of those who have been participating. It's continued to grow, and we've received more money from more backers who have been able to uh, lend some financial assistance, so this way we are able to really put some more money towards some magicians who could use some relief. So thank you, everyone, for your participation in that. The project is going to continue for another four weeks, so if your name is drawn randomly and anonymously, then you will be a person who is going to be a benefactor from the relief project. So you can go to the website blog, and there at the bottom, if you are someone who could use a little bit of relief, just fill in your name, or you know someone who perhaps could use some help, then if you would uh, just put their name and email in there then as well. Well, this week we're going to be talking with Mark D'Souza, who is a friend of the Magic Word and is also perhaps a good friend of yours as well. He is well known around the world and has won many contests, and well, we'll get into him a little bit more and tell you a little bit more of his bio and what we'll be discussing, but he is also offering a prize or two in a contest we're going to start running here this week. He's going to be giving away a copy of his book, D'Souza's Deceptions, and also his four DVD set that was produced by L&L called Masterworks of Conjuring. Again, the information on how to enter the contest will be given after the end of this episode. But first, I think it's time for a little bit of humor from Norman Beck. A couple of weeks ago, started talking with Norman, who likes to, uh, he's a very funny guy, likes to kind of help keep us amused during these times and so he's got a thing called stump the joker so uh, there have been some ideas that have uh, come to us already since we first put this out and all you have to do is to submit an idea if you have a subject and you can stump him then he's willing to give you a free set of his lecture notes And we have uh, quite a few actually in queue. We've had a lot of people who have already submitted some ideas. And if you have an idea, again, that you think that you can stump the Joker with a particular topic, just send that to me. That's scott at the Magic Word podcast. And we will perhaps use that as an idea in the future. And you might be able to stump him and win some free lecture notes. So for this week, let's dial into Norm and see what he's got for us. Joe Hotline, how can we help? Hey, Norm. You know, after we had our discussion last week, we did have several people who had called in with some different ideas of some opportunities to perhaps stump the Joker, see if we can have some uh, fun with this. So um, I say, tell you what, just to get started with something, I've got uh, a a random subject here and um, would like to see if perhaps you might happen to have a joke about collecting or hoarding or accumulating or something like that, because a lot of magicians are collectors. But uh, if we really get down to it, I think a lot of us are really just hoarders (laughs) and we call it collecting. So have you got uh, perhaps some humor about that? Well, you know, my dad, he was a bottle, bottle collector. A bottle collector. Hmm. Yeah, it sounds better than saying he was a drunk. <laughs> yeah, I would think so. That's good. <laughs> you, you know, up in Washington, D.C. last week, they had a terrible incident involving collecting. There was a, a big traffic jam, and they guy comes walking up, please, and then he said, sir, what's the problem? He said, oh, he said, it's horrible. He said, Donald Trump is in the middle of the intersection threatening to commit suicide by putting himself on fire because he ran out of money, and he said, we're out here taking up a collection. I said, well, that's great. I said, I want to support the cause. I said, how much you got? He said, so far we've got 14 gallons of gasoline and six lighters. Okay, okay. And, and, uh, you know, uh, a friend of mine was a coin collector, and he kind of wanted to get his son on the same track. His son was pretty young, and whenever he wanted to have a little quiet time with his wife, he would take a roll of pennies, and he'd just unwrap them and throw them out in the backyard and tell his son, as soon as you find those 50, I'll give you 50 more and let him go out in the backyard so he and his wife could have a little private time. Mm-hmm. 
Only problem was he only ever threw out 48. <laughs> so he's still out there looking. <laughs> That's right. Now, one of my favorite my favorite stories about collecting, there was a, a very eccentric man that died, and the, the estate, the attorney called his nephew, and he said, you know, your Uncle Harry died, and he said uh, he had two pieces of art that he wanted you to have. He said he had a Stradivarius and a painting by Van Gogh. Well, now, the guy didn't really like art, and he couldn't play a violin, so he took him to Christie's auction. You know, that's a big auction house up in yeah. New York where they sell stuff. And the guy said, you know, the, the chances of these being real are pretty slim. And he said, but I'll be happy to appraise them for you. So he called the guy back in a couple of weeks. He said, I got good news and bad news. He said, what's the good news? He said, well, your uncle was a, a very astute collector. You have an original Stradivarius that nobody knew about, and there's also Van Gogh that was unknown in the art world of today. This is almost unheard of. He said, that's the good news. He said, what's the bad news? He said, the bad news is, he said, Van Gogh made really bad violins, and Stradivarius was a horrible painter. <laughs> I like that one. That was a good one. Well, let's get All into right, a, so you say yeah. you've already got some people that are going to stump me. Yes, uh, and in fact, you've actually covered one of them right there because one of the suggestions, uh, I was going to give you three different topics, and one of them today was going to be about uh, the president. And so you've covered one about the president right there uh, today. So it crossed that one off there, and that was uh, the president was, because he said, yeah, no way makes jokes about the president nowadays, tongue-in-cheek. And uh, that was actually one that was brought up by Curtis Waltermeyer. Okay, uh, so here we go. This is a tough one. A, a cornucopia. Cornucopia. Well, you know, I had some out last night for supper. That corn was awful good. <laughs> All right. There you go. Uh, that was from Leland Hirschman. He didn't stump him on that one. Okay. Let me give you this uh, this other one here. Magician's Code. The Magician's Code. That was invented by Mr. Morris. The Magician's Code was invented by Mr. Morris. Okay. Yeah, you know, don't you know about the Morris Code? I thought everybody did. Did that, uh, did, did, what, did, uh, well, yes. <laughs> that may be a little too cerebral. A, a real little bit. You couldn't go off in a different direction with that, can you? Well, I think that ought to count because it is code and it is Morris, and Morris was a magician. But. Oh. Was he? I didn't know Morse was a magician. That's an interesting um, little piece of Arcania. Yeah, I just made it up just now. <laughs> <laughs> but he could have been. Well, that was from James Elsman. So, uh, all righty, we'll, we'll count that one. Well, this is fun. And tell them, that, you know, uh, I, somebody said a joke about the president. I do have one joke about the president. One thing I did learn, I want to tell you all a story. Now, this is... This is almost true. I was in South Texas. I went in the bar, and I walked in and ordered a beer, and I said, I got a great Donald Trump joke. And it got real quiet. And the bartender said, before you tell that, you need to know something. He said, I'm a Trump supporter. He said, my two bouncers, they both voted for Trump, and their two brothers are in here right now. They also voted for Trump. Now, do you still want to tell a joke about Donald Trump? I said, no, I don't have to explain it five times. <laughs> That's a good variation on the, that. Yeah, block. you can tell that to anybody. And I'm not picking on Donald Trump. I mean, I, you can pick any politician. I mean, these are, you know, this is, this is, I'm not, I'm not ever going to pick on anybody but me. So right. please don't anybody get offended because I'm just using his name because it's convenient if it would have been. Eight years ago, I would have said Barack Obama if you'd been before that. I'd been Richard Nick. I mean, I'm right. going to I'm like, going to pick on whoever's there. So. Right. I like your plug and play. Anyway. All right. Well, thank you very much, Norm. And we got some more that people have sent to us, and we will we'll have some more later. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye.
Well, thanks, Norm, and thanks also to listeners who have submitted their ideas, and I'm looking forward to getting a few more of these, and I hope that uh, you enjoy these chats I'm having with Norman Beck, and if you do, then drop me a note on, if you don't, I'd like to hear that, though, and also. Well, this week we're going to be talking with our friend, Mr. Mark D'Souza. Uh, Mark is really a person who has a winning combination. He is a multi-award winning magician at the IBM and SAM, performed at FISM, and has created a lot of his own effects. He has a book and some DVDs that are out, and he not only is a very creative magician, but also a musician. And the first part of our conversation actually is talking about a few other magicians he's gotten together with who happen to be musicians. And I think that some of his friends are kind of cool that you get to hear about uh, during this conversation then as well. But beyond that, and being a world traveler, but also quite a collector and historian, and we talk about a little bit of all that, he just really has the whole package together. That's why I think that's just a winning combination. So please listen and enjoy our conversation with Mark D'Souza here on The Magic Word. I can always add it this later. That's right. I'm just going to jump into this. I'm sorry that uh, for those of you who are just now joining us, we see on the podcast that I just uh, turned on the recorder. Um, I'm here with Mark D'Souza uh, from Philadelphia. Hey there, Mark. How are you? Hi, Scott. How are you doing? <laughs> Fine. Thank you. Uh, so, um, we, oh, gosh, we were just talking about uh, some funny kinds of things where that uh, people think that um, they, they know magicians. They see someone on the cruise ship. Sorry again, like you're saying about on the cruise ship, the what? So, so yeah, I've had like, you know, uh, relatives, uh, uncles, uh, cousins, whatever. They're on a cruise ship and there'll be a magician on the cruise ship and they'll say, oh, you know, we, we have a cousin or a nephew who's, who's a magician. And the magicians all go, yeah, 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 you know, that's very nice and all. And he says, uh, oh, maybe you know him. His name's Mark D'Souza. And, and more often than not, they go, oh my God, yeah, Mark, oh my God, <laughs> you know, we, I've been to his house. I've lectured for him. You know, it's just, <laughs> it's really funny. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, that is, you know, um, some years ago when the first time we had had the Super Bowl in Houston, the Jimmy Kimmel Live was looking to host his show here in Houston. And uh, he solicited people to say, hey, you know, uh, let us see what your house looks like. We might want to come and you know, shoot from your home. And there were thousands of people who had sent in their videos. I did as well. And I was one of eight houses or people who were selected to uh, be considered. And so uh, a team was sent out uh, and they kind of looked at the house, interviewed me and uh, the family, et cetera. And and, uh, they liked the fact that I was a magician. And the story I'm getting to was that the fellow who was the producer was uh, saying, uh, oh, you know, I really like magic also that uh, my, my, uh, nephew, I believe is my nephew, is a magician also. He said, I don't know if you know him or not. And I said, who is that? And then he said, uh, Steve Cohen. I said, well, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's a small world, you know. Yeah, we, <laughs> I know we, Steve. We kind of know, know Steve Cohen, yeah. <laughs> kind of, yeah, that's right, kind of. Well, listen, Mark, you know, that uh, it's it's great to get to a chance to talk with you that uh, it's you are uh, someone who uh, is uh, has such a, a varied background in magic and having performed and won so many contests with not only local but nationally, internationally, the SAM, and uh, have uh, many books and DVDs and everything out, plus other kinds of things that you do and collecting, uh, not just uh, books. You've got a massive uh, book collection, and, of course, you host lectures uh, there in your home, as you just uh, alluded to, uh, as well as collecting uh, guitars and uh, different friends and people that um, I just think that, like, for an example, you would say that you kind of did a session with uh, Steranko, and he's a friend of yours. And for the people who don't know who Steranko is, uh, let's talk about that for just a second before we get into your friendship. But could you tell who Steranko is? Yeah. Well, I mean, I first became aware of Steranko because uh, when I was a kid, I, I loved comic books, and particularly Marvel comics. And uh, Steranko was really one of the godfathers of what are known as graphic novels. Uh, he, he may have been the originator of them. Um, and uh, he did Nick Fury. Um, I mean, he just did so much stuff, uh, so much stuff in the comic book world. And um, then I became aware of Jim Steranko through magic because he did a couple of uh, special issues of Genie, one entire issue on escapes, another entire issue on card magic. He, of course, wrote the book Steranko on Cards, which was uh, originally published by uh, Magic Inc. Uh, and there's a whole story there that we won't get into. Um, <laughs> but uh, I met Jim 
at a Star Trek convention back in gotta be early to mid seventies. There used to be these huge, and I mean huge, Star Trek conventions in New York. Mm-hmm. And um, they don't have them anymore. Well, not really Star Trek conventions so much. Uh, I, I think Comic it's Con, really I guess. All Comic Con, Fantasy Con, ah. you know, all kinds of. Uh, but but the just sci- pure science, you know, Star Trek conventions. They weren't the ones today. Aren't like these were. These were absolutely huge. Uh, it, and I remember uh, my buddy Jeff Strauss and I going up to the Commodore Hotel in New York to the uh, the uh, uh, Star Trek convention there. And somehow we got involved with some of the people that were running the thing and mentioned that we were magicians. And they ended up booking us uh, <laughs> to do magic at Star Trek conventions. How cool is uh, that? How cool is that? Like walk around, like strolling? We didn't do like a stage show, I assume. No, no, we did stage shows. Wow. We did stage shows. With a theme? And did you theme science fiction kind of stuff to it? Sometimes. Sometimes we did. Time travel? Or what? <laughs> yeah, we did all kinds of weird, weird, you know, weird science fiction kind of stuff. But we did straight magic, too. And the cool part was whoever the stars were that were appearing there, we would always get them involved in the show, and they would be assisting us. Sure. Um, and, you know, some of us became friendly with some of them for a, for a period of time. It was really, really a lot of fun. But Steranko was often there in the uh, in the dealer room uh, selling stuff, and he did a great, great uh, Star Trek poster. Uh, uh, hmm. Amazing artwork. Steranko is just an incredible artist. Um and um, so, um, you know, I would talk to Jim, you know, I'd, I'd attempt to talk about magic and he didn't seem to be too keen on talking about magic. Uh, but, you know, we talked a little bit of magic. And over the years, I would see him at science fiction conventions and I'd always bring up something about magic. And, you know, he'd kind of very casually mention something, but, you know, kind of toss it off. And then um, probably 15 years ago, I get a call from Dick Hatch. And he says, um, do you know Jim Steranko? And I went, well, you know, I've met him a number of times. I don't know him. He says, well, Jim's kind of been getting back into magic and kind of staying on the fringes of it. And he heard that you've got Tamarese coming in for the convention that you're producing. This was the East Coast Magic Spectacular that Mike Miller and uh, uh, Jeff Leach and I used to uh, take it over. That was it, M A E S. No, no, this was the East Coast Magic Spectacular. It oh. started out, uh, Marty Martin and Danny Archer, who now run uh, Smoke and Mirrors Theater here in Philly, uh, they had started this convention, and Mike and, and Jeff and I uh, worked with them on that convention for years and years. Uh, and they finally decided they're giving it up, and they just, just turned it over to us. They said, if you want to do this, just take it. So we ended up uh, kind of expanding in the convention, bringing foreign talent. and I brought in Tamaris, and... Uh, and a bunch of people came in that year to see Tamarese, Sure. Uh, specifically, including like Bob Kohler came in, Eric Mead came in, Tim Conover came in. There's a whole story there. But um, uh, but Hatch said, Storenko really wants to see Tamarese. I said, I would be happy to have Jim there as my guest. Uh, so I got a call a few minutes later from Jim. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, he came to the convention as our as our guest and you know, kept very low profile, but you know when you see him walk into a room, if you've ever seen a picture of him, he is unmistakable. Um, this swept back mane of gray pompadour with dark sunglasses hmm. in a you know slick tailored suit. I mean, he cuts an impressive swath, as, as we say. Yeah. Um, so people would go up to him and they'd, "Are you Jim Strang? Yeah, yeah." And they'd ask him questions. He was more than willing to answer. And he showed a couple of things to a couple of guys. Um, and as it turned out, Jim lives less than an hour from me. He's up in Reading, Pennsylvania. And so every once in a while, he would come over to my house for lectures. Uh, he and Leonard Green were very close friends. Uh, I still think they're, they're, they're pretty close friends. Uh, a lot of Leonard Green's stuff is based on stuff that Steve, that, uh, Jim created. Uh, back in the you know 60s um and we had actually arranged for another east coast magic spectacular to have jim and leonard do a panel discussion together wow that would be kind of a workshop lecture session thing Mm -hmm. didn't advertise it it was going to be a surprise leonard was you know announced as one of the guests but jim was going to be the surprise 
And like two weeks before the convention, Jim called me and said, I got bad news. I said, what? He said, I got booked for a real convention, meaning mm -hmm. real money. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a very high paid guy to be at these uh, science fiction and art and comic conventions. Uh, and I said, oh, I'm really sorry to hear that. I understand. Uh, he said, well, when's Leonard coming in? I said, well, he's coming in on Friday afternoon. I'm picking him up and he's staying with me. He says, well, can we get together Friday night? Sure. He said, I don't have to be at this convention until Saturday. I can get there Saturday morning. I said, okay. So we had a little get together, about a dozen people at the house. And it was just like this informal sessioning and drinking and eating and having a great old time. Until the end of the evening, uh, everyone had left except for the two guys that were staying with me, who were Leonard Green and Terry Guyett from England. Uh, you probably know Terry because he had been to a uh, number four F convention. Right. Uh, Terry is one of the, you know, secret heroes of mine. Um, not a lot of people know who Terry is, but boy, he is an amazing guy and, and has an amazing story in and of itself. Just how he got into magic. Just absolutely wonderful. And, and his magic is immaculate. Uh, and, uh, so it was Jim and Leonard and Terry and I and, and Leonard says to Jim, do you still play guitar? Because uh, Jim was in a rock and roll band. I mean, he was, you know, when I say rock and roll, I mean like 60s, early 60s, late 50s, early 60s rock and roll. And he says, uh, yeah. He says, Mark, do you still have your guitars downstairs? I said, sure. He said, come on, let's go. And we all went downstairs. Jim picked up a guitar. Leonard picked up a guitar. I had no idea Leonard played guitar. Huh. Well, he plays in a style very reminiscent of Django Reinhardt. Um, kind of a flamenco gypsy style of guitar. Terry, as it turns out, plays keyboards. And I had a portable set of keyboards down there. And I said, well, I'm not going to play guitar. I picked up an electric bass. And we had like an hour jam session just playing music. And, and, and after it was all over, I said, damn, the one time I should have had a camera rolling <laughs> was the ultimate Leonard Green Jim Steranko session that'll never get heard. Never uh, but, be replicated. I, yeah, uh, but I have a couple of photos and uh, <laughs> and the memory. Yeah, how cool is that? No, that's true. I remember that uh, Dick Hatch knew uh, Stranko and, and how that connection had, had come about then as well because he, that is Stranko, had started kind of in magic and kind of drawing kind of on the side before his cartoon, or I say comic book, uh, graphic novel career really rocketed and kind of got out of magic. But did he actually exit magic because of that or was he kind of frustrated in seeing people rip off ideas? Uh, well, that was, that, was, that was really, you know, now that everybody's gone that's involved, I, I you know, I, it, it's like one of the worst kept secrets in magic. But <laughs> there was a there was a second book that Steranko had written and uh, Jay Marshall was supposed to publish it. Um, and he had sent it to Jay and Jay had a relationship with Ed Marlowe mm -hmm. and Ed Marlowe. I won't say forced him, but coerced him into letting him look at the manuscript and before anything got out there there were some things that were published not under Steranko's name I don't think we have to mention whose name I think mm -hmm. you can conjecture that um, and Steranko was so incensed by this that he pulled permission to publish the book and, and just dropped out of magic just instantly mm. and Oh my gosh, it must be, I don't know, 30, 35 years before he ever stepped back into magic. So when I spoke to him, you know, in those early days of the Star Trek conventions, he was still feeling the smarts from, from that whole situation. And I, I think that's kind of why he was reticent to talk magic with anybody. Mm -hmm. And when he was out, he was out. He never really did get back in. And it was only, I think, uh, through your dragging him back to kind of get... Well, no, it wasn't. It wasn't me doing it. I mean, he decided on his own. I guess enough time had passed, and and he, you know, he somehow the interest got rekindled. I, I don't know how or why, uh, but uh, and maybe he had been contacted by Leonard. Uh, I I don't know, um, but uh, he had been purchasing stuff from Dick, uh, books and manuscripts, uh, and and that's when he brought up, you know, wanting to see Tamariz and and Dick connecting the two of us together. Mm -hmm. I have a poster of his, which uh, was the is the Norval or Norgil? Norgil. 
Nor Nor Gill. Okay. That is signed by both him and Walter Gibson. Okay. I I have that same poster. And uh, interestingly enough, I have that hanging over the commode in the um, in the uh, magic section of my home, our lower level. Um, and one day when Jim was over, actually the first time Jim was over, I saw him heading for the bathroom. And I kind of lingered outside the door there <laughs> to kind of intercept him when he exited. And he came out. And kind of tilted his head so he was looking over the rim of his sunglasses at me Mm -hmm. and said, I'm hanging over the toilet. (laughs) And I said very calmly, Jim, that's because that's the one place everyone will be able to focus on your art. (laughs) And he laughed. <laughs> uh, good retort. That's very good. Yeah. I have a picture of uh, Ali Bongo in me, actually. That is a uh, picture that was inspired by the one that's uh, in the bathroom at the Magic Circle, <laughs> where that you're looking at the backs of the two of us in black and white, uh, and it looks like we're standing at a urinal. And then the next picture beside that is we're turned around in opposite positions, and in holding in our hands, we have a fan of cards that we're looking at. You know. So. <laughs> It's good. Yeah, it's, yeah. I, uh, I, I have I have a, a more more recent photo uh, that is uh, bathroom oriented uh, of uh, Harrison Greenbaum um, from a- a- SAM in Las Vegas this past year. Mm-hmm. Um, Harrison did a masterful job. I mean, he did everything at that convention except serve dinner d- during the banquet. That's a good point. Um, he did about everything. <laughs> he oh was my god! Performing and lecturing and uh, on the uh, roast panel and everything. Yeah, yeah, he was very good. So. Um, when he did his his late night adults only show, it was in the old theater at the Golden Nugget. Well, mm-hmm. this is the theater where they had, I mean, all of the greats of entertainment. This is where they performed. It was amazing. Mm-hmm. And he, I, I, I was asked to, to introduce him, so I was backstage, and Harrison comes out very excitedly and starts dragging me by the arm and says, "You got to see this. You got to see it. his dressing room." On the door, it just says "Mr. Sinatra," and. He had Frank Sinatra's dressing room, hmm. um, and they left it just as is. They did not change a thing, not a st- piece of furniture, nothing. And so uh, we were taking photographs, and, and uh, Harrison was very insistent that I take a photo of him on the toilet. <laughs> I always thought that was a great story also about how the Jay Marshall has a pair of Frank Sinatra's cufflinks. You've heard that story. I have, yes. I but believe that's, I mean, that, you know. That's in a the lot book. Of listeners have no idea. Yeah, what we're talking about, and that is in the book that uh, Sandy had written uh, about his dad, I believe, then as well, in which that he was sharing that as Jay Marshall was performing with, uh, I think, an opening for Frank Sinatra, and he was in the dressing room, and apparently that Frank Sinatra did not have his normal cufflinks and was very upset, and so they just had brought him something they picked up somewhere, and he wore them during the show, and after he was finished, uh, since the two of them were, I don't know if they were sharing the same dressing room, but anyhow, that Jay happened to be in there whenever that Frank Sinatra had thrown the cufflinks into the trash can, and he looked at, the, Jay looked at it and said, if you don't want those, can I have them? He said, sure, take them. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's how he got Frank Sinatra's cufflinks. <laughs> yeah, listen, you know, there there are stranger collectibles that we've seen, believe me. <laughs> That's true. Now, you travel around a lot uh, around the world and have performed in different places, plus just uh, like with me, attending a lot of uh, conventions and meeting a lot of really uh, cool people, including FISM and a lot of other things. Have there been any kind of... How can I say, a unique kind of a convention or a one-off or something, or maybe even a larger convention that is uh, really memorable to you? Well, um, you know, a lot of times when magicians talk, they talk about, like, what's the best magic show you ever saw? Yeah, kind of um, thing, yeah. There is, there is one convention that stands out to me, um, and that was uh, the SAM in Boston, and I believe it was 75. Um, yeah, it must have been, yeah, I think it was 75. There was one show that was just you know, just the stellar, stellar array of performers, including um, including Johnny Thompson, who was, I think it was a very, one of the, maybe, I don't even think he, he was with Pam at that point, uh, but he did, he did the Tom Sony act. Mm-hmm. Norm Nielsen, 
who performed on the fir- for the first time in- on any stage the ending where the violin comes out and takes a bow. Hmm. Um, Del Rey. The MC was Jay Marshall. Ali Bongo. The opening act was an unknown act from Baltimore named Danny and Lee. And to me, the highlight of the act of the show was, of course, Fred Caps. Wow. Oh, I cannot imagine a more power packed lineup than that. That's just just astounding. <laughs> that is amazing. And, and what convention was that? That was SAM in Boston. I think it was 75. You know, Fred Capps is someone I always wanted to see or meet, and the only closest time was when he was to be the guest of honor at one of the Las Vegas uh, summits. Desert or Seminars. Desert right. Seminars. And yeah. I had registered. I'd been to a few of those, and those were always a great social event that uh, Joe Stevens and his uh, team had put on. But uh, Fred had apparently contracted cancer and he was still planning on traveling and it got worse and couldn't travel so i never got a chance to see him so obviously you had seen him perform live i've seen him perform live a few times i'd seen him lecture a few times i had the opportunity to to meet him and talk with him um yeah yeah he was you know the best i i've never seen a better all-around magician uh, than caps he was just uh singular did you ever get a chance really to sit and chat with him or just kind of, I guess, hover around in his cloud I, I, and watch him? I talked to him a couple of times, asked him some questions. Um, um, you know, he he I, I was young, <laughs> yeah. so, you know, I certainly not someone who commanded his respect or anything, but he was he was nice enough. Um, he could be uh, terse with people, um, but um, he was nice enough to answer questions for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, nothing in depth. You were a kid, but obviously. I was, and, kid. Mm-hmm. I was young. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I was still like 20 something. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, over the years, I've, I've really made it a, you know, a, a, a mission, if you will, uh, to really study, study his work and, you know, do what I can to, to research what I can about caps and, uh, spoke to a lot of people who, uh, who knew him. Mm-hmm. And uh, kind of tried to wheedle what information I could. Well, I remember I'll at the uh, Magic Live last year, we had a, a great talk that was by... Um, Dick Cornwinder. Dick, thank you, Cornwinder, exactly, who apparently yeah. was a close friend of his. Yes, yes. And um, you know Dick, obviously, and... Uh, I know Dick. Dick, mm-hmm. Dick, is, Dick has stayed at my home, uh, and uh, Dick... Dick Saw to it that I acquired my first Fred Capps material, you know, stuff that Fred owned. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, he conducted the auction that took place at uh, at Tannen's Jubilee, which was the saddest day of my life, probably, uh, because I could not be there. I, I was moving homes that week, and that could not be changed. And uh, so I missed out on that auction. But Dick saved a couple of things for me uh, as he was staying with me right afterwards. And... Uh, um, and we talked a lot about caps. Mm-hmm. What of his is in your act now, or something that you do, no, or I, was inspired by? The only, the the only material that is quote unquote in my act at this point. I, I I'll preface this by saying that just as a course of study, the act that everybody knows of caps is. Um, I I worked out each of those routines and at one point or another performed each of those routines just to have done it, just to go through the exercise of what caps went through to create it and, and to, to be able to perform it as close as I could um, to, to caps uh, performance. And there's other material I have as well on video that I've worked through um, that, you know, was gained through videos from exchanges with people all over the world. Now, most of those are available for everybody on YouTube, mm-hmm. um, which is great. You know, I, I suggest everybody go on YouTube and look up Fred Caps uh, to see, you know, what the brouhaha was about, just how good this guy was. Um, but in my act currently still is uh, a routine that I created based on um, his uh, jumbo coin manipulation with the chest and the, the diminishing bills. And the diminishing bill said I had Fred's, I have Fred's actual set. I remade a set uh, for myself 
and added one little thing that I think he would have liked. Um, but the coin routine, the regular size coins, I have changed the routine because I was not, I was not as happy with the routine that Caps used, which was um, Die Vernon's uh, coins and the handkerchief routine, which is in print. I mean, that's 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 all over the place. Mm-hmm. But I just didn't think it was quite as visual as I wanted. Um, so I substituted a uh, a sequence that was taught to me by Pierre Brahma, uh, another great FISM winner from France. Um, so I've, I've substituted that in. But the uh, jumbo coin manipulation is all based on caps. It's not the complete caps routine. There's two or three little moves and sequences that I left out. Uh, just for the sake of time. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've, you know, worked through everything. Um, a good case of point, uh, the smoking thumb. And, you know, I had to do a lot of research to, to find out exactly, you know, what, what that was and how that worked. And, and eventually I, I did get, you know, the real work on it. Uh, and, and Dick Cornwinder, I believe, is the one that came up with the system that he used to make the smoke appear in the glass. And that is the beer coaster on top of the brandy snifter. I think that was Dick's contribution to that. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, I don't use that method. Um, it involves chemicals. And I'd rather not right. uh, uh, schlep around the chemicals. I came up with an electronic version, uh, which is more of the type that everybody uses now to make the smoke appear in the glass. Um, but the actual handling of the uh, smoking thumb, uh, you really have to study caps to understand how really good and really clever this was. And not only that, you have to know something about his physical attributes to understand how and why it works the way it works. So at FISM, and I believe it was FISM in Den Haag, or it may have been Stockholm, I'm not not sure, uh, there was a Fred Capps tribute lecture or talk mounted, uh, which Dick Cornwinder was a part of, and my friend, the late Pete Byro. Now, Pete had acquired a gimmick that he said was Capps' smoking thumb gimmick. Now, this is listened to primarily by magicians, so I'm going to kind of tip something here. Sure. Uh, but... Um, if you're not a magician, you hopefully won't understand it anyway. <laughs> um, Caps had done a TV show in which he did some performances for children, and one of the tricks he did was smoking a spoon. Well, uh, what he would do is he would take a spoon, just a regular spoon, out of his pocket, and he would pretend to take a bag of tobacco and pour it in the spoon. He would pretend to light a match and touch it to the spoon, and he would he would kind of like puff on the handle of the spoon and blow out real smoke. Fortunately, Dick Cornwinder had shown me that gimmick, and I was able to compare that gimmick to the smoking thumb gimmick, which were the same principle, but different sizes. Okay. And there are technical reasons for that. Well, Pete Byro had acquired the smoking spoon and said, this is the gimmick the Caps used for the smoking spoon and also the smoking thumb. So I said nothing during the lecture, but afterwards I I found Pete. I said, Pete, that's not true. He says, sure it is. That's that's the smoking thug gimmick. I said, it's not. He said, how do you know? I said, well, first, I've seen them side by side. And the smoking spoon gimmick is a lot smaller than the smoking thumb gimmick. But I can tell you it doesn't work that way because here is the sequence that Fred used to transfer the gimmick from hand to hand. And I showed him. And I said, look at my hands. My hands are smaller than Caps's were. There's no way he could have done this poem in this way with that gimmick. And he looked at me and said, damn it, you're right. Hmm. So, so he, it's so, only through the study and the, 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 the ridiculous... Uh, detail, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Um, Minutia that you have to go through. Exactly, to, mm-hmm. exactly. But, you know, it, it, it's, it's the truth. It's the truth. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Now, as far as the Caps cash, that was that different from Pat Page's uh, flash cash, and was there some controversy about who did what? There was definitely controversy about <laughs> it. Yeah, yeah. Pat, Pat really did create. Um, he did that. He, created, he called it easy money. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that was Pat's creation, and what Fred added to it was minuscule, uh, and he had it in his notes. Um, 
which uh, were sold by Ken Brook. And later, a second edition was printed where there was an illustration sheet done by my friend, the late Earl Oaks. Explain yeah. in better detail how to make the gimmick. But it's, yeah, it's Fred is the guy that really popularized it. Uh, but uh, it really is, uh, it really is uh, Pat that, that really created the thing. And, and Fred used to use it in his act. He used to use it in his act. He had right. paper. He had white paper that became bills. And that was the start of his money routine, his bill routine. Isn't that in uh, Pat Page's uh, book, I believe? Probably is. Uh, I can't imagine why it wouldn't be, but it was something that was marketed separately. Magic Inc. did market it as easy money. Right. I know that was a pretty thick book. It had a lot of material in there, and uh, after going through it, it just kind of started to jumble together. So I don't remember if that was in there or not, but I would think right. since that and, was a signature and, piece. Yeah, and, that, and, and the effect was paper to bills, which was then, you know, uh, it was then, I won't say confiscated, but then very mm -hmm. to change ones to hundreds or, you know, just to do bill changes. And, uh, um, you know, everybody and his brothers put out a different version of that. And Inspired variations, basically. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you know what? I'll tell you something. I, 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 there was somebody and I can't remember who it was. And it may have been Gregory Wilson who asked Pat, who said to Pat, I, I'm publishing this thing. I want to put your name on it. And and I believe Gregory got permission from Pat, and he sent Pat money, <laughs> hmm. as I recall. Good, yeah. Uh, but, um, uh, well, you've had yeah. a lot of things yourself uh, that you have invented. I mean, you're uh, and had several books uh, that you have uh, published uh, then as well. What would you say would be perhaps your, your best-selling uh, book and or trick or DVD? Well, the... Um, there's one book, D'Souza's Deceptions, uh, that David Acker wrote. Um, I thought you had a second yeah. follow-up. No, no, that's the only book. There okay, have been, sorry. You know, a number of lecture notes, but that's the only actual physical book. Now, there's been, you know, videos. I back in the back in the early '80s, I did two videos for MVN, Magicians Video Network, my buddy wow. Ken Chris. Mm -hmm. One on close-up and one on my my stage Manipac. Uh Mayor Yedid uh, owns the rights to those, and I think he you can get those as downloads from his site. Uh, but then the big project was the LNL four DVD project that I did, um, and that is still available. But the um, as because you far teach as, like linking rings and also the ball. Um, yeah, the, the, the mm -hmm. first the first DVD was the you know my my award act. The it was essentially the uh, a single ball routine. Um, it was with the vanishes and reappearances and color changes with a, a rose. Uh, that was kind of like the thing that linked it all together. Uh, the linking rings, uh, zombie. Mm -hmm. uh, those were the three things that were the, the core. I, I did not teach the caps, bills, and coins at that point uh, because there was a book to have come out sure, sure. on the caps work, and we can talk about that later too. But uh, that is in 40 that, years still. But not that was kind of like the core of your routine that took you to FISM. That, that's, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, that I won. You know, that's the core routine. I won uh, SAM in uh, 78, mm -hmm. yeah, 78, and again in, I believe it was 89. Uh, and essentially the same act. I mean, there were a couple of other things in the act in 89. Um, but uh, I, I didn't compete with that act at FISM. FISM, I competed in 79 with a whole act based on dice that... Um, uh, it was a stage act with dice, big dice, and uh, Steve Dushek had helped me create a, a lot of the material in there and built stuff along with my buddy Walt Wolba. Um, and then in 82, I competed again with a more standard Manip-type act. I didn't place either time there. Uh, and then again, I, I competed at FISM in 97, uh, having won IBM and SAM close-up in 96. I competed in 97 representing SAM uh, doing close-up. I didn't place there either. Uh, but uh, 96 was to have been my retirement from competition. I started in competition in 1968. I figured that was enough. Uh, but they coerced me into competing one last time at this. And so I said, yeah, sure, you're paying my way. I'll do that. Wow, that's uh, that's great. And there again, I'm sure you have a lot of good recollections of FISM. Which Where were those uh, held in the FISMs where you competed? 
79 was uh, Brussels. I went to Brussels myself. Um, and uh, then after that, I, I took another week and went to Amsterdam, Paris, and London, and I had a grand old time. Um, and uh, uh, then in 82 was Lausanne, Switzerland. And uh, had a lot of fun hanging out with a lot of friends there. And uh, uh, Jos Bema, Tommy Wonder uh, being one of them, uh, we spent a bunch of time together. Jos and I had been friends already for a number of years. And um, and he had introduced me to Escania. We were on a, uh, a little cruise on, on Lake Geneva. And uh, Escania was sitting by himself. And Tommy, Jos said, you know who that is? I went, no. He said, that's Scania. I said, well, ask him to come over. <laughs> he just happened to be on the same boat at the same time. And he was sitting by himself. He okay. Was just sitting. Was and, he playing uh, with cards or something? He was. He was. Of and um, uh, we invited, they said, do you speak, he said, do you speak, Sp- uh, do you speak Spanish? I said, no. And my other friend, uh, Michael Dorman, said, uh, oh, I speak French. And he says, Scania speaks French. So he came over and Scania literally performed stuff for us for over an hour. Oh my God, that wow. was just, that was life changing. <laughs> that was just incredible. Escanio on Lake Geneva. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> what yeah. a memory. A, a private, a private show for like six of us. It was, mm-hmm. you don't get better than that. You no. Know? <laughs> but you, you were asking, you know, what, you know, what thing, you know, is my best seller, whatever, whatever. The one thing that I think magicians, world over know me for or know the move at least the shapeshifter uh, which mm-hmm. is that color change you know at the fingertips um which and, is done up as opposed to down i mean aaron fisher has uh, his uh, um what am i trying to say aaron's uh hmm, his twi- his aces twisting aces kind of in the hand is down but yours oh, you're- is that right? No, there's that no different? similarity. This is this is this is kind of like some guys call it the flick change. Oh. Um, mine is 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 done in the down position, and I mean I've told this story a lot about how how I created it. It was actually because of the uh, the one and only lecture tour I've ever done was in, in Texas. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, oh, for Bob uh, Carlback way back exactly, when. Exactly, mm-hmm. exactly for Bob Carlback, may he rest his soul. Yeah. Um, so when I was in uh, McAllen, Texas, hosted by my buddy George Robinson. George Robinson, yep. Yep. Who um, owns, uh, by the way, Collector's Workshop now. And Viking Magic. And Viking Magic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so uh, George, uh, we, we did the lecture, and we went out to Denny's afterwards, and this guy um, says to me, hey, can I show you this color change I've been working on? I said, sure. So he shows me this thing where he... He does a double lift on the deck, and then he kind of fumbles and picks it up and holds it in front of his face and does this move where the thing changes while it's held between his finger and his thumb, and then he takes it and turns it back and then lowers on into the deck. Uh, his name was Oscar Munoz. This is before anybody knew who the heck Oscar Munoz was. Yeah. And and I said, you know, I think you got something there, Oscar. Uh, can I play with that? And he said, yeah, sure. So I got home and literally, you know, uh, you know, in a day, I had changed the handling completely so that now it's just turned over, boom, it happens, drop back, and now it's turned over. So there's no, it's not in front of the face, it's on the deck, it's held in a more standard position. And uh, I called Oscar very excitedly. I said, Oscar, grab a deck, try this out. Uh, and he said, well, that's good. He said, I, I like mine better than I said, great, do yours. Uh, this is the one I'm going to do. And um, Steve Beam, Steve and I have been friends for years and years and years. Steve's a color change nut. We were at a convention, and I said, hey, Steve, I got something for you. And I do this thing for him, and his eyes just pop wide. He goes, oh, my God, show me that. You know, show me the handling. And I show him. He says, I got to have that for Trapdoor. I'm going to put it on the cover of the next issue. I said, well, you know, here's the lineage of it. If you're going to put mine in, I think you should put Oscars in, too. Mm-hmm. So let's call Oscar and let's see if that's okay. And Oscar was more than pleased to to have that. He'd never had anything in you know print before. Um, and so that was the and Steve's the one that named it Shapeshifter, not me. Uh, and that kind of took off. And and there were what people does Oscar start, call his? Uh, he calls his the pure wet change. Okay, pure, pure wet change. So um, 
people started doing it like it spread like wildfire, but with neither my name nor Oscar's name attached to it. Um, and there were some people that put her on video projects without any credit. And uh, we tried to make sure that that credit got out there. And those people were very apologetic. They said, we just didn't know who it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, we weren't trying to claim credit for it, you know. Um, and literally, anywhere I go, somebody's doing that dang thing. Uh, I wish I made money off it, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the the truth of the matter is, we, uh, you know, Brad Christian, who owns Illusionist, um approached me and said, I'm doing a PSA for Gamblers Anonymous. Uh, do you mind if I use the move? I said, well, show me what you're doing. And, and he sent me a video. I said, well, you're not doing it quite right. Let me you know, tell you a couple of things you might try doing differently. And uh, and he did it. And he sent me the finished product. It looked great. And then he said, well, listen, um, can I can I put this out as a download? Well, uh I was involved with uh, Larry Haas's uh, uh, magic conference at Muhlenberg College, and they were trying to solicit, solicit donations from magic dealers, and Illusionist was one of only two who did anything. And I said, you know what, since you were nice enough to contribute to this, uh, you can put this as a, uh, as a download uh, with the proceeds going to the program. And mm-hmm. that was nice. nice. And then he called me back. He said, well, we'd like to put it as a DVD. Is there anything else you can add to it? I said, well, I got some extra stuff. Uh, but if we're doing that now, it's a commercial project. So, you know, let's come to a deal. And we did. And um, uh, they sold that for years. And um, my goodness, I made more money off of that than I ever imagined I possibly could. Um, I still get tiny little royalty checks, but I've had a falling out with the illusionist and I've asked them to take it off their site. I've asked them to take off any mention of me on their site. They've refused to do so. So I have nothing, I have nothing nice to say about illusionist anymore. Who, do, who have you aligned with as far as any other dealer? Well, um, I, I, I love aligning with dealers because, um, I don't like doing anything myself. I, I have dual degrees from Penn State University in marketing and management, and I have never used either of those in my magic business. <laughs> I'm the worst <laughs> marketer of magic in the world. Um, so everything I give to somebody else, there is a uh, the the two D the two early videos uh, were MVN. I had nothing to do with the sales of those, and you know now Mayor has those. Uh, the book and also Chain Gang, which is my endless chain routine. That was Camera and Academy. Well. Uh, Gee sold the business to Vanishing Inc., so now Josh and Andy own, own me. Um, and L and L did the uh, the four DVD set. Uh, so the only thing I have that's you know commercially mine is when I do lectures and you know one or two products I'll sell right. at a lecture. There, right. there there is a trick I've been doing for years that is my handling of a trick by uh, my friend Claude Ric from France. Um, uh, I call mine Die of Destiny, and it's been a, a closer for me. I was about to uh, talk about the uh, the Die of Destiny. I, you uh, you gave me one of those some years ago, and I still play with that. That's great. It, it's it's a great trick. It's a great trick. And and I learned that trick from Cloud. Gosh, I was still in my teens when he came to America and did the lecture tour. And I saw that trick, and I said, this is just a killer. I'm not going to show this to any magicians for a long, long time till they forget about it. Mm-hmm. And um, I did it in my shows constantly. It's, it's Like I said, it's a closer. It's really difficult to follow that trick with anything. And there's a lot of pros that I've, I've shown this to that will carry multiple sets so they can do repeats at trade shows or mm-hmm. at corporate functions. And, um, you know, I've just, over the years... It's like anything. If you do a trick for for enough time, you develop a handling that becomes your own. Your 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 patter, you know, your scripting, your your attitude towards the thing, the moves you come up with, the variations and the handling, just the the little, like you said, the minutia of it, the mm-hmm. little details that really add up and make it so much better. Um, and um, so, I didn't show it to magicians until there was a lecturer who will remain nameless who did it in his lecture with no credit to cloud and sold it. And I just, I said, "Ah, that's awful. And, uh, and a dealer friend of mine said to me, well, your handling is much better than his. Anyway, we should really put this thing out. I said, you can put it out, but I don't want my name on it. It's not my trick. It's Clorick's trick. Yeah. 
Um, and I had enough people that said, you know, what you're doing is beyond what Cloud did with it. The presentation is is just so distinctive and so strong that it's it's really become a different trick. And yeah, all right, put it out. I I got nothing from it, you know. But I would show it. I would teach in the lectures, and I would just make up decks and sell them, you know, literally for the cost of making it up. But um, a couple of years ago, my buddy Randy Shine called me up and he said, um, I'm going to do Penn and Teller Fool Us. I said, great. He said, well, the trick they want me to do is die of destiny. Can I do it? I thought about it. I went, yeah, but I have an advanced handling that if they know the original is going to fool them. So I taught Randy this advance handling, which again was based on a cloud idea. Uh, cloud and I met face to face at vectors a few years ago. Uh, he was very, very appreciative that I made certain that his name was attached to that effect when it was published in my book. And whenever I, I did it in lectures uh, and he showed me an advanced handling he had come up with and I learned it and I did it. And I said, I think this could be better. And I changed it based on his advanced ideas. I, I modified it yet again. And uh, I contacted cloud and I said, here's what I've done with it. He said, you know, I played around with it and I didn't think it was as good. I said, well, somebody asked me if they market, could market it, and I said, I would not allow them to market it without your blessing. And he said, well, my version is coming out through a French dealer, and I'd appreciate it if you didn't. And I went, absolutely, it will not get marketed. Mm -hmm. But I did give it to Randy to perform on uh, on Fool Us, and it still didn't fool them. It still uh, didn't? It didn't no, fool them. because uh, Penn said, well, does the name Cloud Reek mean anything to you? <laughs> So he had been tipped off oh. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't think Penn knew who Cloud Reef was. Uh, yeah. But, um, but uh, uh, Johnny Thompson had called Randy beforehand and said, you know, this is not your trick. He said, no, it's not. Mark D'Souza showed it to me. He said, well, it's not Mark's trick. He said, well, um, Mark learned it from Cloud. He said, it's Cloud Reek's trick. He said, Mark learned it from Cloud. He's made modifications to it. Um, and I'm doing a new version that even if you know clouds, it will fool you. He says, and he tells him about it. He says, great, that sounds terrific. Can't wait to see you do it. As it turns out, Johnny has a handling of it that he put in the book. <laughs> so oh, that's I funny. think there's just, there was just so much going on with this trick. That, there are a lot know, of hands on that. Yeah, exactly. So it wasn't going to fool Penn and Teller, but it didn't matter anyway, because, you know, Randy just needed the footage for his uh, showreel. Sure, sure. You know, you touched on a couple of people during this conversation, and it seems like every generation that there is someone who comes about who is well-known within our magic community that is highly revered, uh, in which that we'd had Fred Capps, Di Vernon, and Johnny Thompson, and with uh, those people no longer here, my offering of I would think people should consider uh, that I think Charlie Fry might be the next guy, if he's not already. So do you have someone that you think is kind of like the uh, this this next generation uh, that the torch is being passed to from uh, mm -hmm. our elders in magic who are kind of brilliant well, and creative? There, 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 there are two names that come to mind that I've mentioned for a period of years now as being the quote-unquote successors to Vernon. Um. And the two names are Michael Amar, because Michael is a wonderful teacher of magic who understands what makes a good effect. He, he has great taste in selecting effects that are really just great magic. And he has a way of teaching that just makes this magic accessible for the every magician, as it were. But the guy that I really consider to be the real genius is John Carney. I just think I just think that he is just such an amazingly versatile magician who is a great theoretician, who is a great technician, and who has a great sense of the performance of magic. And if you've ever seen John do his full evening show, which I've been fortunate enough to see, 
oh my gosh, that certainly drives that home. I, I just think he is phenomenal. Very creative, very original, and uh, that's right. He thinks about magic all the time. Now there, there good. is there, there's a couple of young guys out there who, who I think have the the potential of being in that league. I mean, obviously you've got the whole Spanish school, mm-hmm. um, led by Danny Ortiz, um, who I think is kind of you know. I won't say the shining light, but I think of anybody who's really encapsulated that whole manner of thinking and the psychology and the theory and the practice of magic. Danny's certain out, certainly out there. But a guy that you had on your podcast about a year ago, Bernardo Sedlasek. Awesome. Holy cow. Mm-hmm. I was just knocked out by Bernardo. I spent a bunch of time with him at Vectors last year. He was supposed to be coming to my house to lecture. I was so looking forward to it before this whole problem hit. The other guy is another young guy that had been at Vectors, Ed Kwan. And uh, my understanding now, Ed went back to Korea, at least for the moment. Uh, but boy, what a what a talent he is and what a uh, what a studious young man who has studied the classics of magic and everything he can find out. He's like a sponge. He's absorbed this and has put it into practice and can do it. And I'm incredibly impressed with Ed. Yeah, I um, uh, I think that Bernardo Sedlacek is amazing. Also, as I was just watching a recent video on YouTube that Penn Jillette had put together, it was an ambitious card project, kind of like yes. the aristocrats. Yes. And yes. Uh, right. they would just hand one deck. Of, it was very well made. Anyhow, the, uh, the Bernardo was one of the people in there. And I've noticed that since that has come out, and it's had I don't know how many thousands or maybe now millions of uh, downloads, uh, that people have uh, realized, who is this guy? They start searching, and they find that I had a conversation with him. And he's taught me some stuff that wasn't in the lecture. He spent a couple of nights with me and uh, showed me some things that he was working on, and I have not shared with anybody, but I would show it to real people because it is really astounding. And he really has a great way of thinking. But I tell you someone else who I I think is the Cosmo has had kind of tipped me to, to, you know, thinking about this guy of being the next Die Vernon uh, is... Garrett Thomas. That's the guy. You got it. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm incredibly impressed with him. Garrett is amazing. He's a great teacher. He explains things so that you understand it. It's not too technical. Uh, and his things uh, can be um, can be complicated, but they're not convoluted, which is a big difference there. Uh, and also that he recognizes and thinks about how that this is going to be the surprise. In other words, that you should be able to do a trick that the audience will be able to explain to someone within a sentence. My exactly. card stuck on the ceiling. You know, his ring moved from my hand to his, whatever it is, you know, that they're able to under, explain that. And uh, he, so he, he cuts to the simplicity of that. And so anyhow, I think Garrett is another amazing talent. Right. And and which, when you say simplicity, it reminds me of the words oh. of Rene Levan, who said, it's simple, oh. it's not easy, but it's simple. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah, I think Garrett's Garrett's magic really is, is very impactful material that gets right to the heart of the matter. And, and again, great theoretician who puts his theories into practice in his work. Absolutely superb stuff. I'm, right. I'm so impressed with his stuff. Well, thinking of uh, Simple, this has simply been a wonderful hour that has just passed so quickly. And I just uh, was looking at the clock over here that uh, can continue to go on. I always enjoy our time getting to spend chatting about whatever it is, uh, you know, life and things in general. And there are other subjects we didn't didn't get to. Uh, and and uh, cause not only you're a magician, but a musician, as you touched on then earlier. And so that's just uh, fantastic. So thanks very much, Mark. If I can, Scott, can I just put a plug in for something? Sure can. Thank you. Uh, On April 16th, I'm going to be doing an online lecture. Uh, It's being sponsored by the SAM. This will be uh, broadcast until after that. Okay. Well, then you can go back. I think you'll be able to go back and look for it because I'm told, I was told today that it's going to be a Facebook Live. So that means it'll probably live on there somewhere. Um, But I'm doing a, a lecture that'll be broadcast worldwide. Uh, free for magicians anywhere, 
and you'll be able to check on Facebook to see how you can access that. But it's not my normal lecture. I'm doing uh, some things out of my normal lecture. Uh, I am doing Die of Destiny on it. <laughs> okay. Um, but um, some stuff that was taught to me by magicians when I was younger that I, I want to make sure it doesn't get lost. Yeah. So even if you have missed this uh, when it was done live, that it will be streaming, so you can go back and catch that at a later time. We'll yep. name my podcast, as you well know, and we've uh, you've uh, helped me on this on many occasions in the past when we've done some um, convention reviews and that kind of a thing. But I always like to know, of course, uh, what the magic word is for my guests. So what is your philosophy of life? What's your wow? Well, you know, I would I would have had an an answer right now. The 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 philosophy is stay safe, stay sane, stay inside. Mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> I think, but you this know, too shall pass. This too shall pass. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I I think magic is an art that needs to be shared, not just by magicians, but with everyone. And I think if we approach magic as if it is an art and that we say something with our magic, then people will be able to relate and enjoy that. I like that. Yeah. You should perform magic that uh, people can relate to. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I have a wonderful collection that has lots of shiny boxes and things, but um, it's rare that I trot, trot, trot those shiny boxes out for performances because they're, you know, they're not terribly relatable. They're not really meaningful to most people. So, uh Exactly. I'd rather be able to do magic with things that people can go, oh, yeah, I, yeah, I got that at home. <laughs> I can relate to that. Yep, that's, yeah. I like that a lot. Well, Mark, thank you again for your time. This has been uh, just simply delightful. Thank you, Scotty. <laughs> Always a pleasure. And, and hopefully we'll be able to, uh, I'll be able to do color for you again next, next year at Vectors. Yeah, I, I know we will. And so for the Magic Word Podcast, that was Mark D'Souza. This is Scotty out. Well, that really was a delightful chat, and I do thank you very much, Mark, for being my guest here this week. I, I do want to thank him also for the generous donation that he had given us. Uh, again, I mentioned at the first of this podcast that uh, there will be a prize or a couple of prizes that are being awarded. His book, uh, D'Souza's Deceptions, and also then the 4 DVD set that's being made available then, too. And those will both be available for registering for the contest at the blog. If you go to themagicwordpodcast.com for this week, for this episode, uh, number 5, 562, then you can have an opportunity to enter the contest. And this is going to be for those who are in the continental United States because he will be sending this out, compliments not only of him, but also postage compliments of Mark as well. So this is going to be on his own nickel. So therefore, it's just going to be shipping within the continental United States. He's not going to pay for the increased shipping that goes overseas. So this uh, contest, unfortunately, is just going to be limited to those, again, in the continental United States. And so just go and uh, register for that. But whether or not your name will be selected for one of those two uh, gifts, one of the things that he is offering to all of the listeners is uh, is a great deal on a couple of things. The book D'Souza's Deceptions is almost out of print. He said there are less than 40 copies remaining. And the retail in the book is $60 from Vanishing Inc. And but if you buy it from him, the price to listeners will be just $40. And that includes the companion DVD, which Vanishing Inc. no longer offers. And the four DVD set from L&L is now available from him also for $50. And those prices are only good for those of you who have heard it here. So what you need to do is to send him an email, and that's F-K-A-P-S at AOL.com. So that's like for Fred Caps. <laughs> you know, he mentioned in the podcast how much he loves him. So it's F-K-A-P-S at AOL.com. And mention the magic word because the offer is only good until the stocks run out and also for those who are listening and identify that you heard it here on the magic word. So if you can't wait to find out if you're going to have your name drawn as one of the random lucky winners or that you would like to buy one as a gift, or whatever, then right now, then contact Mark, and he'll be glad to accommodate. 
Well, that was a lot going on here this week, and I want to thank you all very much and remind you again to sign up for our pod letter. It's a weekly pod letter that, or newsletter, I call it a pod letter. I made that name up. Uh, I coined the phrase pod letter for a podcast, basically telling you what's happening from week to week, what's going to be happening next week, and then notifying you of any kind of contest like the one we just announced here. So until next week, stay well, get booked, and remember to relate to your audience. And the best way to do that is performing magic that people can relate to. This is Scotty out.